From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, this is an episode in the Remote Works Citrix Virtual Series. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in our Palo Alto studio here um, on this kind of ongoing leadership uh, series that we've been doing, reaching out to people in the community to get kind of their take on you know, what's going on with the COVID situation, what are best practices, what can we learn, and really this, specifically today, really the whole new way to work and, and working from home. And we're really excited to have two guests on for this segment. The first one is Amy Hayworth. She is the Chief of Staff for HR for Citrix, joining us from Florida. Amy, great to see you. And, Great to see you, Jeff. Yeah, Thanks and also uh, Tamara McCleary, who's been on many, many times, coming to us from Denver. She is a, a, a well-respected speaker. You've probably seen her doing more speaking than anything else, and also the CEO of Thulium. Tamara, great to see you. Thank you. I'm so excited for this conversation. Yeah, well, let's just jump into it. So it's so funny and, and doing a little homework. You know, Amy, I came across a, a change man, a professional change management executive conference 2015 and you talking about building change management um, as kind of a profession and, you know, working from home was part of that. And that was like five years ago and things kind of creep along and then we have you know, a light switch moment where there's no time to plan, there's no time to think, there's no time to implement things. It's everyone must now stay at home. And so, you know, kind of outside the human tragedy that is this the COVID situation, we're not going to really speak to that here, but from a business point of view, suddenly with no warning, everyone had to work from home. From someone who's been in the profession of trying to drive change management through kind of a process over time. What, what does that do for you? How do you, you know, kind of digest that suddenly, oh my goodness, we've got this light switch moment, which is a forcing function that may have never come, but now we have to go. I wonder what your uh, take is. Yeah, you know, I think the thing that gets me most excited about this light switch moment is it is showing all of us that we are capable beyond what we ever thought we were when it comes to change. We've been called to take a leap. And for much of my experience in the organizational change management field, we spend a lot of time talking about managing resistance and the pushback about change. And there's even a saying that drives me crazy, which is change is hard. Um, I don't know why we tell ourselves that message. And I think what this is showing us is that number one, change is inevitable. It's going to happen. There is very little control that we actually have. But also we are more resilient, more adaptable, more capable of change than many of us knew that we were. Um, and it is calling up for me, what do we need to put in place within organizations to cultivate resilience, because one of the things I think this is making all of us very aware is how um, volatile the world actually is. And it's also laid bare where we are strong individually and able to cope and where we also may need to do a little bit of practice and some very intentional resilience building. So I think the conversation around the whole change management field is about to change. Right. Um, and my hope is that that focus turns more to resilience than it is to managing change. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because a lot of just the chatter that's that's out there, right, is about Zoom. Do I use Zoom? Do I not use Zoom? Is it secure? That All this other, you know, kind of people like to jump into the technology piece, but really, you know, we had your boss on the other day, uh, Donna Kimmel, the EVP and Chief People Officer at Citrix, and she, she broke it down into three buckets. Culture was number one, physical space is number two, and digital space was number three. And I thought it was really interesting that she really leads with empathy and human factors. And I think that, that it's easy to kind of forget those, but bringing up s simple things that, oh, not only are you working from home, but guess what, your kids are home too. Uh, and your spouse is home too. And they have meetings and they have Zoom calls they have to do. And oh yeah, the dog is still running around and, and all the other kind of distractions. So the human factors are so, so important. Tamara, one of your early, uh, keynotes about your kind of early development was in, in your early career working with people who were kind of at the end of their life. And I know it helped you develop, you know, kind of an empathy and really a prioritization that I think a lot of people are probably getting today uh, that maybe they haven't thought about, you know, what is truly important? Um, what is truly meaningful? And this kind of, again, is this forcing function to say, you know, let's pump the brakes a little bit, take a step back and think about what's really important and the human factors. Or if, you know, again, get your take on this crazy situation. 
You know, I think you're you're absolutely right, Jeff, in the fact that, you know, really what this has done, to Amy's point, yes, we are we are very capable of change, but we're mostly so resistant and unwilling to change. And it's not it's not because we don't want to, it's because we fear uh, what will happen if we do change. And sometimes it's what the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. And right now, what has been forced upon us is to really think about critical issues, right? So when you're, when you're faced with a lack of toilet paper and uncertainty about your survival rate, um, you start to think about things in terms of, say, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're looking at that base level, that safety piece. And when people go to safety, they have you know, really left that area of self-actualization and what do I want to be? What do I want to do? It's more about, oh no, you know, what have I done? Do I like my life? Uh, and I'm stuck here at home, wherever you're sheltering in place. And, you know, is this really, am I really enjoying my life? Am I experiencing my life? And um, what we really have experienced through being forced to get onto video conferencing, how many of you out there are doing video conferencing like a billion times a day? We're being forced to really see each other as human beings. And that means whether you're the CEO or you're the EVP of global blah, blah, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is your dog is still barking, your child's still running around and needs something from you in that moment when you happen to be on a call. Because as we all know with kids, when you say, I can't be bothered for the next 30 minutes. What do you think is going to happen? That's exactly the time when they you know, need more grapes. So I think that what it does is it levels the playing field and it shows us all how human we are. It shows us our strengths, as Amy pointed out, and it also shows us our um, communal frailty. Right. So let's get into some, some of the specifics about what people are, are feeling. And um, so Citrix just commissioned this this uh, report put on by one poll, um, pretty timely, comes out in April 2020, about really working from home. And I, I think there was really some interesting stuff. Still connectivity and bandwidth, still like the biggest challenge that people have. Can I even get online was the number one problem. Um, and, and when they do, their, their Wi-Fi is slow and there's single sign on, you know, all these things that we've been talking about for years and years and years. I mean, why, 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 Amy, have we still not gotten it done. It's, a, it's, it's fascinating to me that in 2020, we still have internet connectivity issues and people don't know how to turn on their microphone, on their Zoom call. We're so far behind. Yeah, you know, Jeff, I think what we're seeing is, number one, it takes practice and sort of the need to be familiar with all these tools. Um, I also have talked to many parents who, um, first day of home school, if my son tells me I can't call it homeschool because it's different, it's virtual school, he says, it's very different. Um, but that first day, you know, especially families with multiple children trying to get onto a Zoom call with their class, parent is trying to work, possibly two parents in the house are connected. Our, our home Wi-Fi networks just haven't taken this kind of load before, but very quickly, I think we needed to realize as an organization that this is not work from home. This is working at home during a global pandemic, and it is very different. So you mentioned that need to lead with empathy and to really understand what's going on. And I think that's so true in just the, the humanness of, of what we've experienced. Um, that one full research really talked about a few, you know, kind of epic moments of mishap, whether it's taking a call from the garage. I have a colleague who would take from the car on the street, you know, still sheltering in place, but the only quiet place to go to actually take a call. Um, we have a, a legend in our Singapore office, a, a salesperson who made record numbers working from his garage for a month. Um, so there are all sorts of heroics taking place to to balance and in the midst of that when technology isn't acting as we would hope it would under normal circumstances having to adjust really quickly whether that means staggering schedules um, working through accommodations with teachers however it needs to happen but I, I think the reality and the acceptance going back to that humanness and empathy is that we all have to shift our mindset about what work means and who even are at work. We, we've built up a lot of these polished button-up personas. And when we are 
able to actually let some of that down, I think what we're starting to see is connection on a much deeper level amongst teams and among, among colleagues. Yeah, I was, I was just, I'm just looking at the, the survey at, at how few people think that this is going to roll over into a little bit more of a permanent form. Only 37% think my organization in general will be more relaxed about remote working. Um, I think staff will be allowed to work from home more regularly, 36%. I mean, it's, it, we had Martin Mikos on and he ran um, MySQL before it got bought by, by um, it's her son many moons ago, right? And he talked about he had a distributed team from day one and he, he, he laughed. He said, it's so much easier to fake it at the office, right? To look busy versus when you're remote, as you just said, I mean, you're only judged by your deliverables. And I, th I thought it was so funny in your, <laughs> in your blog post from, from earlier this year that when managers start managing by outcome and deliverable rather than assuming his get, work's getting done because someone showed up at the office. I mean, this is ridiculous that people are still judging things based on activity, not outcome. And we're even seeing now all these new tools that people are introducing in the marketplace. I, I can tell you how often your people are on Zoom and how many hours on the, on the VPN. It's like, what are, what are we measuring? We should be measuring outcomes. And, and, and the piece that comes up over and over is trust. And if I can't trust you to deliver outcomes, I probably have a bigger problem than managing your day to day. Tamara, you, you see this all the time in terms of the trust and how important this is to relationships. I do. And in fact, our workforce at Thulium is has always been a remote workforce. And, you know, for the way that I've built our organization is treat everybody like an adult and get your work done. And we do base everything uh, upon productivity versus FaceTime. And I think that the reason some of these larger organizations um, have had this, you know, concept of you know, show up having that FaceTime means that you're you're putting, you know, whoever gets there the earliest and leaves the latest somehow has been a better employee. It's not true. It is about productivity. And I think that, you know, those wise organizations that look at how much they can save with the cost of like AC, heat, the building costs, having a brick and mortar for everyone to come into is very costly. And it's an old paradigm that a lot of middle managers have, which is this control piece. And that if the people are there in the office, they've got more control. And actually what we find is you don't need that kind of control, especially when you look at the younger generational cohort coming up, how they have a totally different view of work. And we've talked a lot about the future of work in the gig economy. And I think what this COVID pandemic has done for us is to show us that actually work does get done at home. And in fact, in some respects, more work gets done at home because it's harder to stop working when your work is happening right there at home. And so it does blur the lines and the boundaries between the work life and the home life. And so I think you get a lot more out of your employee when they work from home. It is funny when, uh, when Donna was on, she, she brought up a really interesting topic she said, you know, every time somebody pushes back on that can't be done from home, right? This, this, this job, this person, this type of task can't be done from home. The question should always be like, why? You know, it almost sounds kind of like when you move the whole kind of cloud conversation that we've been tracking went from, you know, should I move stuff to cloud to why shouldn't you move to cloud? And, you know, it's not, does it work on a mobile? It's, it should be mobile first. And now this conversation is kind of morphing this to, why can't somebody do it from home as opposed to it has to be done from the office? So I think even just the, the relative flip of kind of the, the context of setting up the question um, seems to be changing. That's why it surprised me that so few people think that it's going to go back. It's, it, it clearly, especially as this goes on for a while, right? New, new behaviors become habits and they become normalized. And hopefully, uh, you know, the senior management pays attention to the outcome and again not this activity uh, which is really not that, that, that that's not what you want people to do you want them to actually get stuff done you know and Jeff and Amy the other thing I was going to say is um, you know Amy when you look at the report that Citrix has put out you know how many people are even going to be able to go back to work when kids aren't going back to school and then we have summer you know, you know, piggybacking onto that. So now you've got parents who have kids at home. You know, what is that outlook? You know, to me, it's not just this simple, okay, it's over, let's go back to work, guys, because the rest of our life has completely shifted as well. 
Right. Uh, that was actually my conversation today uh, is starting to really think about um, holistically when it comes to policies, programs, what are we putting in place for the summer? And, and not only that, but um, even some of our, our employees who have been alone through this, um, you know, I think at the beginning, there was a, a very large shift on those who had children or elder care to, to think about. And, um, you know, at some point, at least in this half of the world, about last week, we really started to hear, you know, I'm kind of worried about this person who's been alone by themselves in their apartment sheltering for, for over a month, you know. So I think as we start to look at the, the variety of experiences people are having, um, really being sensitive to different personas in the organization, different needs, different emotions that are happening. And as we even start to think about what does it mean to come back to work? And I you know countries and organizations are being very cognizant about doing that safely in a very gradual type way of, of thinking about it. Um, but it starts to get very, very complex very quickly. Um, and also from just a let's do this well, because there's a whole new set, Jeff, you bring up a whole new set of questions of, of employees asking, I wasn't allowed to work from home prior. I would like to do that more often now. Um, new conversations with managers about, well, how are we going to measure results? There's, there's a lot of work to be done between now and then, whatever then is, to really ensure that, that we help everyone be successful. Right. Um, and, you know, I think the conversation we're having is, it's, likely not going to be one or the other. Um, the new normal is not the or old normal, and we're not sure what it is, but it's most likely there's going to be some sort of hybrid working arrangement. You know, right now the, the playing field is leveled, and that in and of itself is a very different work from home experience. What happens when it's hybrid again? And there's some who are remote, some who are in the office. How do we make sure that it's equitable and all the voices have equal opportunity to, to chime in um, because when a, a group of people are in the office and their colleague or two is remote, it's not a level conversation in an organization. So whether that's establishing norms or really just starting to create behaviors where if one person's remote, then everybody's remote, no matter if you're in the office or not, you dial in uh, via go to meeting or whatever collaboration tool you're using. So all sorts of things to think about. Um, but I think what it gets at is, is our ecosystem of work is going to change for sure. It was so funny in your blog post, you talked a little bit about that as well. And one of the, the little paragraphs was, you know, who gets, who gets to do it? Right, like, like it's like this binary decision. You can either work from home or you can't. And, and you know, there's this whole second order impacts that we see on infrastructure, right? There's nobody in the, in the trains. There's nobody on the freeways. You think, wow, we actually have a lot of freeways if everyone is not on them at the same time. So, you know, begs a lot of questions are why is everybody driving to work at 8.30 in the morning to work on their laptop? Now, clearly if you're, you know, in construction or service trades and you got a truck and you got to go do something on site, you know, they have to be there. But I think, you know, hopefully what this will do is help people, as we were discussing, look at those who can, you know, and even if it's one day a week, two days a week, one day every couple of weeks, you know, the impact on infrastructure, the impact on you know, traffic, the environment, mental health, even you talk about mental health, sitting in a car for an hour each way every day certainly is not helping anybody feel better about themselves or, 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 or get more work done. So I think there's just so many benefits if you just you know, kind of look at it in the right context, focused on who can, not who can't, and, and, and the how and the why and the enabler. But it's really interesting. We've talked a lot about kind of the physical space and the culture space. I mean, imagine if this happened in 2006, right? Before the iPhone came out, the smartphone. Um, I mean, think of the crazy amount of tools that we do have. I mean, right now we're talking and, you, and we're spread out all over the country. Um, so we're actually in a really fortunate space in terms of the digital um, kind of infrastructure that we have in place to enable these things. And, and I know Citrix, you guys have been in the lead of supporting this forever. Now you even have a whole uh, setup of resources. It's called the Citrix Remote Work Hub um, for people to get resource to figure out everything from the mental health to the, to the Wi-Fi connectivity to all these other little things. As Tamara said, how do you manage the kids and the dog and and your your significant other that also has you know Zoom meetings that they have to attend? So it's so many resources that people need to 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 use and not feel uncomfortable that they're alone and and could use a little bit of an assist. 
absolutely well said. You know, when this when this quickly became a forced experiment to work remote, Citrix has 30 years of history um, helping enable successful remote work in a secure way. And the first thing that we wanted to do was be of service. Um, so pulling together these resources has been a big project and um, we're so glad to be able to provide this tool set and we we truly do help that it it makes this transition um, stronger better it will continue to grow and to evolve even as our own experiences evolve new challenges arise but we we definitely want to keep it fresh and keep meeting um, the, the need that's out there both internal for Citrix as much as and as long as we've been doing we don't have it all figured out we are learning too this is uncharted territory for for everyone, um, but also to to take what we we are learning and put it out there in a very transparent way. Right. I want to. You know, it was was. Ahead, oh, I'm sorry, but there was just something so crazy, Jeff, about the study that Citrix put out. And Amy, I wanted to bring this up to you because you know you think you you said you know some of the the coworkers were like, well, so and so lives alone. I wonder if they're okay if they're lonely. But in the study, barely a quarter of the individuals reported any loneliness. I find that to be pretty shocking. It is, it is shocking. And it, you know, I think it really speaks to um, how quickly uh, those, those happy hours, the Zoom happy hours or the gatherings and some of the creativity that started to, to pop up. Um, but yeah, you make a great point, Tamara. That was surprising. And I'm curious if that will continue to be the case. Um, but, but yeah, it's good I to guess know. maybe some of us, when we got home, we're like, wow, you know, this isn't so bad after all. And then can you imagine? So, so Jeff, if only 28% of people experience any loneliness, imagine when you can have peace and quiet in your home again and still work. I think that, <laughs> you know, this, this really is a lot more delicious than a lot of us anticipated it would be. And how, what a grand social science experiment this has been. Right. It's, it's phenomenal. The fact that everyone is experiencing it at the same time globally just blows my mind. I was, I was here for the earthquake. I was in Portland from Mount St. Helens. I've been to a few little things here and there, but those are still regional, right? There's still a safe space. There's still people that don't have that story. Everyone, six or seven billion people will have a where were you in March 2020 story, which is, was fascinating. And then, and then, as you said, it's not only the work from home, there's no time to plan and no time to put infrastructure in, but oh, by the way, the kids are home too, right? And school is also from home. So, you know, in terms of, of an accelerant, it's just, it's just gasoline on the fire. But I want to jump in a little bit about one of the things you talked about, Amy, and get your take, Tamara, because you're doing it in your own company, and is in terms of uh, establishing norms. Um, I, think, I think, you know, people are maybe not thinking about the fact that they either need to establish new norms or they need to be very clear on the communication of what the norms are are so that everybody is, as, as you said, Amy, kind of feels comfortable in this new space because we have kind of norms at work and now we have to have these new norms. And you know, there's all kinds of funny stuff going on in terms of, we talked about dogs and kids of this and that, dress, do you not dress, do you put makeup on? You know, I mean, it's funny in the survey, do you take a shower? Only 30 some odd pe people <laughs> take a shower every day, which I thought was kind of what about uh, unexpected. Shoes? What about the shoe comment? <laughs> Can you believe that, Jeff? Like People actually would wear their shoes to their desk. Yeah, I, oh. well, but I'll tell you, they didn't ask the women because the women would not be wearing high heels at home if they didn't have to. They didn't specify which shoes, Tamara. They just said shoes. So maybe the more comfor comfortable, comfortable <laughs> flats were the ones that were coming out. But I'm just curious on on establishing social norms, Tamara. Let you go first. How did you establish them? Was it hard to do? Did they kind of did they kind of self self generate? And and as a leader. Um, do you have to police it or is it kind of self-policing? How's that work? And then Amy, from your point in terms of formal communication in a much bigger organization um, and being part of the HR office, one might say, well, isn't that already kind of part of HR's charter, but how's that different now? Tamara, let you go first. Sure, it's a great question because since we do have a remote workforce, one of the, the most salient things that I found to be critically important for productivity and collaboration and even cohesion and decreasing those uh, silos between business units is making sure that we form a community. And so what I mean by that is we have, and always have had, I mean, we've, we've been using video conferencing since before the pandemic. And 
we have video conferencing meetings where um, video is on, you know, so that's one of the parameters because everybody needs to see everyone else's faces. And we have a morning kickoff meeting, um, kind of an all hands meeting. And then we have an end of week one as well. And part of that piece we call a stand up where people either share something that's um, either um, a challenge within the workplace or with a customer or even in their own personal life. And then they, sh they end on something to celebrate because I think it's really important for us to cultivate that, but it really helps the teams to get to know one another. So just because someone in this business unit doesn't work with someone in this business unit, they know one another because of these team meetings that we have. And so I think creating a culture of positivity and collaboration versus competition and creating a culture where uh, people feel a part of a team and a part of something bigger and where they see that their contribution makes a difference to the whole creates a really delicious community that helps um, people feel valued at work. And I think with a remote workforce, you have got to pay attention to how you are creating that community and that feeling and sense of value to each and, and every individual within the organization. Yeah, it's a very different kind of a challenge. Um, Amy, your, your thoughts on, on kind of more of a formal approach to establishing social norms at some of these bigger, bigger organizations, or do you treat it differently as a big organization or is it just a bunch of small little clusters of, of people that work together? I have so many thoughts on this. I would love to have a two hour dialogue with both of you on this topic. A um, couple thoughts, you know, there's implicit norms that sort of develop organically. And then there's the explicit ones, which for whatever reason, we seem more hesitant to have very explicit conversations about norms. Um, I don't know if people think it's tedious or something like that. I'm not sure. I haven't done that research yet. But in times of transition, it's so incredibly important just even for efficiency to add some certainty, um, to make sure that everyone kind of has the same message, same expectation, to lean a little more heavily on the explicit norms. Um, talking about how do we want to begin our meeting? Uh, let's let's reserve the first 10 minutes and just kind of catch up like we would in the hallway. Um, some of that is a shift to how those meetings probably were happening uh, two months ago. So making sure that everyone understands is that the expectation and even a um, little bit more of a, a kind of a warm up question. How's everybody feeling today? And even getting more specific, there's um, a couple of organizational uh, gurus who I have been following quite a bit lately, Aaron Dignan and Rod Rodney Evans. Um, Aaron wrote a book called Brave New Work, and they also have a podcast, but they really talk about the organization as an operating system. And when we look at norms, um, the norms are so much a part of that operating system and getting really clear about who does what here. Things like how are notes taken? How are we following up? Um, in our current climate, who's checking on who? You know, and so having some of those um, explicit conversations, I think, are incredibly important. And also for me, some of the work that I've been doing over the last six weeks is trying to harness goodness across the globe. So we have a group of site leaders who meet twice a week. Their charge is to look after their, their location. So every location in the Citric ecosystem that has more than 20 employees has a designated site leader during this time. And in bigger sites, they have pulled together committees. Um, they're doing things at a local level to keep that site engaged. Um, but what we're also looking to do is harness the best of the best. Some really amazing things. I did a uh, radio calisthenic last night with our team in Tokyo. So something very true and um, personal to, to the Japanese culture. Um, but other sites are doing coffee chats and having drop-in celebrity guests, you know, organizational leaders that are pretty high profile, just popping in unexpectedly to have a very authentic Q&A conversation. So some really inventive um, ideas to keep keep people engaged and also possibly establish new norm. And I think that's a big question for me is, what do people like so much that they decide that it stays in place when we do have a vaccine and people are in the office more often? What level of connectivity will we, will we keep? You know, even will people start showering every day again? I mean, some <laughs> of these things, who knows what's going to happen? 
So you make me want to go down to uh, to R and B and look at the look in the, the the meeting rooms at Intel. They used to have a very defined meeting culture, meeting process, meeting establishment. Super efficient, just like they're making chips. I wonder if they've uh, if they've changed that look a little bit in light of what's going on. But a final note in, in terms of kind of frequency and variety of communications. You know, both of you now have mentioned you know in in the communications with with your people and what you're hearing about is one is you got to increase the frequency just period and in fact you might actually be communicating more frequently because you don't necessarily chat all the time in the hallways when you're physically together and the other thing that strikes me is the variety it's not just the meeting it's not just information exchange it's touching base with community it's establishing deeper relationships, it's, it's doing some social things that, that, you know, kind of the variety and the frequency of, of direct communication, person to person, just not necessarily closer than six feet within one another, has to go up dramatically and is, as you're seeing, in best practices in this new world. Amy, what of you go first? So, um, I'm seeing a lot more Slack usage. Uh, we are an organization that has a multitude of tools to choose from, Slack being one of them, but highly engaged Slack community. The other um, thing that's become very clear as an insight is the more authentic the, the communication, the better. So our CEO, David Henshaw, has been doing video pieces um, and they have become increasingly more personal uh, about his, whether it's his space where he exercises, what he's doing for exercise. And the employee response has been deep appreciation for feeling several degrees more connected to our, our senior leadership. Um, other senior leaders on the team have kind of profiled their own work from home antics in a very humorous way. And so just finding inventive ways to leverage the communication vehicles we have, but at a level that is very true to the situation we're in and very human at their core. So Tamara, let me ask you kind of a follow up on that. Um, you know, you're big on social. It's a big part of your business, helping other companies do better at social and engage in social. And it, and it strikes me, especially in kind of the real senior leadership ranks, there are those who tweet just to pick a platform, uh, like Michael Dell, uh, Sanjay Poonin, you know, some Cube alumni that, that you know, you know. And then there's some that don't. Um, and again, we talked about the contrast with IBM. Now, you know, Jenny didn't tweet. Now, you know, the new CEO announces it on LinkedIn. Um, when you talk to CEOs and leaders about getting involved in social, I'm sure a lot of them that don't do it just say the risk reward is not there. Why am I going to expose some little personal tidbit of myself when, when the potential uh, harm is great? But as we just heard from Amy, you know, people like to know who the person is. People want to relate to who the person is. That's you know, kind of part of the whole cube thing that we figured out a long time ago is people are interested in the people that are behind the technology and the companies and the implementation. So how do you advise people? What do you see to, 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 to convince them that, hey, it's actually in your best interest to show a little vulnerability, to show a little humanity, to, to, to maybe be scared sometimes and not necessarily have the right answer. How do you help coach them that these are these are good things, not bad things. You know, it's so brilliant you brought this up, Jeff, because with the pandemic, those a lot of the executives that were not on social media all of a sudden wanted to be on social media and how do I do this and how do I set up my thought leadership because this was a very um, primary mode of communication. And I think what's, what we're seeing is that you do see a lot of the progressive CEOs and executive members on social media. And then what you've outlined is there was a he hesitancy by um, a lot of the uh, CEOs who come from a different paradigm in which the hierarchical structure was such that, you know, they got to this level and why do I need to be on social media? And what we're seeing is that this push from the younger generational cohorts, which is they don't really see that um, hierarchical structure at all. And they want to be able to communicate with their CEO as much as they want to communicate with their manager. And when they can't, there is this distrust. And you brought up the trust piece, which is huge. And I do know that a lot of um, you know, global business leaders in 
highly regulated industries have been afraid, you know, like in the financial services industry, because there are a lot of rules and regulations. And so I can understand and appreciate their hesitancy to be on social media, which is kind of like a bit of the Wild West. And, you know, you see those that are really pretty insulated from anything that they do. You can see like Elon Musk can, can tweet whatever he wants to tweet. And a lot of executives don't feel that they have that same sort of freedom. And so how we work with them, because we work in the B2B and enterprise space, is about what is it that you want to be known for? What is it that you're passionate about that would, to Amy's point, be uplifting to your uh, those who not only work internally, your internal stakeholders, but to even your customers or those on the external and stick to that. So no, you don't need to tweet about your political um, feelings. You don't need to tweet about sensitive subjects. Um, you know, we always say away, stay away from politics and religion, but you can absolutely establish a very authentic, um, transparent, vulnerable thought leadership about the things that you care about. And we say, pick three things. What three things do you want people to think of when you're not in the room? Pick three adjectives and then construct your editorial calendar, what you're doing on social media around how those three things are going to come to life through all of your email, through your videos that you share with your, your, your community, and also what you're talking about on LinkedIn, Twitter. And no, I'm not advising any of the executives to get on TikTok. But I do advise them to be on LinkedIn and Twitter. <laughs> Matt Eastwood is starting to play with TikToks. I don't know if you follow <laughs> Matt, but he's a budding Casey Neistat. So he's, uh, <laughs> I think he's getting into the TikTok thing or even just TikTok edits. It's great. So, you know, we could go on and on and on. And I really appreciate the time. And it's just interesting, again, pulling from Amy's, Amy's blog post about leadership. And you lead with trust, accountability, vulnerability, inclusion, and communication. And, you know, I think those are all human things. And I think it's so important. So final word, assuming, you know, things are going to get better. And let's just say a year from now, um, we get back together and talk about how the new way to work has changed in a post COVID world. What do you hope that we'll be talking about that's different a year from now than we are today beyond obviously the, the, uh, the COVID itself. Amy, you first. Wow. Uh, to narrow that down. Um, I hope we are talking about how organizations have invested in helping our people find their strengths and lead with resilience and to understand what it is that helps them operate at their best, no matter what situation that you're in. That's great. Tamara? And you know me, Jeff, I'm going to hope that we are talking about the technology that's available a year from now that's going to help us have a much more immersive experience remotely working. So, you know, we'll be talking about hopefully things like the haptic internet, well, that, you know, that haptic interface with, with um, a tactile internet and how AR, VR and mixed reality settings will help us as remote workers to feel like we're actually in meetings and having this the same sort of experience that oftentimes we think we get only when we're at the, um, the building with everybody else. So I hope we're talking about how technology is really moving the needle forward to helping a remote workforce have that same sort of experience and camaraderie and team building that they do in the physical space. Great, well, and again, there's just digital's different than physical. We're not together physically and we, we can't be right now, but we're together digitally. And so it's not, it's not the same, it's different, but there's a lot of good things about it too. So thank you both uh, for taking the time. This has been a really great conversation. Amy, I agree with you. We could go for another couple hours, but I think the crew would uh, start throwing things at me. So I think we'll have to cut it off here. Thanks again and uh, stay safe and really appreciate the time. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in. Thanks for watching theCUBE. We'll see you next time.